Welcome to the PAS Report Podcast. If you're tired of censorship, outraged by government abuses, and thirsty for real insights, then you're in the right place. Get ready, because here, the fight for freedom never ends. Here's your host, Professor Nick Giordano. Welcome, everyone, to the PAS Report Podcast. This is your host, Dick Giordano. I'm glad you could join me today. Make sure that you follow and subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, visit the PAS Report website, pasreport.com, and share this episode with your family and friends. Now, if you haven't looked at Just the News, you need to check it out, justthenews.com, because there's just a ton of stories breaking over there. And that's why I felt that there's no better time to bring on John Solomon, who is the one that founded Just the News. John, welcome to the program. How are you? Yeah, good. Good to be with you, Nick. We're living in uh, pretty crazy times, aren't we? There's a lot of history unfolding in front of our eyes. There is. And it seems like it's, you know, there's no break. It used to be that news cycles lasted for several days. Now it's like five minutes and another story breaks about yeah, corruption or abuses of power. And I, I want to start off because I was reading one of the reports that you put out there uh, about Joe Biden's advisor, Amos Hochstein, oh, yeah. who was having contact with Burisma as it was being probed, as there was an investigation. So can you elaborate to the audience what's going on there? Sure. Let's remind people who Amos Hochstein is right now. He is the one of the key Middle East emissaries to, for President Joe Biden to the Middle East and the crisis with Israel and Hamas and all the other uh, extraordinary things unfolding in that region of the country. Back in 2014, a decade earlier, he was one of the top energy officials in the State Department, an advisor to Joe Biden on energy policies internationally. He was of great interest to Hunter Biden's brand new client in 2014, which is Burisma Holdings. That's the Ukraine energy company, uh, which found itself with an ambition uh, under the Obama-Biden uh, administration to quickly grow its uh, franchise in Ukraine, but hobbled by the fact that it was deemed corrupt by the government of Great Britain, the government of the United States and others, including its own prosecutors inside of Ukraine. It was uh, believed to have corruptly obtained some of its drilling permits and to have engaged in other corrupt behavior. The State Department, in fact, uh, has uh, testified during Donald Trump's uh, 2019 impeachment that Prisma was deemed uh, corrupt by the State Department. Uh, and Amos Hochstein himself, before we knew of this meeting that we just revealed, he told the Senate in 2020, I can, he personally considered uh, Burisma Holdings corrupt and believed that it should have been, or its owner at least, should have been prosecuted. All right, so he lays down his track that I'm with the State Department, I'm with the U.S. government, I'm with Great Britain. We all thought that um, uh, Hunter Biden's company that he was working for had a corruption issue and should have been held accountable. Now, first off, that never happened. It didn't get held accountable. That's a big part of the Hunter Biden narrative. But what's most remarkable is within two or three months of Great Britain filing through its serious fraud office a complaint that Hunter uh, that uh, Burisma and its owner was corrupt and that Mr. Zolchevsky, the owner, should have his assets frozen. They, uh, they froze like $27 million of his personal assets. Within three months of that, by the way, the FBI and the State Department contributed to the Great, uh, Great Britain's action against this uh, oligarch. Uh, all of a sudden, Amos Hochstein, the guy who told the Senate in 2020, I knew this company was corrupt, I shouldn't be done with them. He actually appears to have had some significant contact with the company. Uh, Hunter Biden and his partners arranged for a one hour meeting at the State Department. Now you can't tell from the documents if that meeting occurred because there's not a specific memo saying here's what was discussed at the meeting. But a couple of days after the date of the meeting, Hunter Biden's uh, team is saying, hey, here's the guy that Amos Hochstein said we need to talk to at the State Department to deal with our corruption issues. Let's go contact them right now while the iron is hot. So uh, Amos Hochstein, the guy that tried to portray the Senate as a guy who didn't like um, uh, Burisma, clearly provided some valuable information to Burisma at a time when it was facing this corruption allegation. Now, if Hunter Biden weren't on the board, do you think uh, Burisma would have got that audience? Almost certainly not. <laughs> and I think that it's the latest in the long line of uh, evidence that Hunter Biden used his family name, used his contacts, his Rolodex, to help uh, often un unsavory characters on the world stage gain influence in America. And in this case, Hunter Biden is directly involved. There's a moment where Hunter Biden is actually forwarding a, a direct phone number uh, to the lobbyist he wants to make the contacts 
for Amos Hochstein, showing that he knew him well enough to have a direct number. That's the sort of stuff that makes lobbyists valuable. It's probably why in the second indictment that special counsel David Weiss recently brought against Hunter Biden, the tax indictment in California, not the gun one that's already resulted in a conviction, uh, the prosecutors went out of their way to add a new title to Hunter Biden's biography. They called him a lobbyist, something that Hunter Biden has often tried to eschew and pretend he wasn't. But prosecutors clearly consider him a lobbyist. That's why they put it in the indictment. And these sort of things that you're seeing, making connections, giving phone numbers, uh, trying to help uh, Burisma gain influence, those are the things that lobbyists do. Well, and I find this really interesting because we know that there was contact between Hunter Biden and the State Department. If I believe correctly, no I think there was even email chains with Tony Blinken. Tony Blinken? Them, actually had a meeting with Tony Blinken. Yeah, that was a FOIA that I won, yeah. So yeah. now you have... Weiss's team putting this idea of lobbyist in, in yeah. the indictment. Now, I, I recall prior to 2017, nobody talked about Farah registering right. as a foreign no. agent. Now we saw that the the, that the Farah laws were used during the Trump administration sure. to Paul target Manafort. Trump campaign officials. Yeah. How come Hunter Biden's not being prosecuted under the and, and I think that's what shows the clear double standard that he has yeah. not faced an indictment. Yeah for failing to register as a foreign agent when clearly that's the capacity he was serving in. And now they put that he's a lobbyist. Yeah. Well, who was he lobbying for? Well, Hunter Biden is the epitome of all the things that Democrats say they stand against. They say that they want everyone to pay their fair share of taxes. Hunter Biden's accused of not paying uh, seven figures worth of taxes. They say that they want people to follow, uh, uh, follow the gun laws, that uh, the gun control laws. And of course, Hunter Biden's now been convicted of that. The third uh, thing that Democrats say is that we really want to end foreign influence on our government. That was what Russia collusion was supposed to be about, though it turned out to be a bogus scandal. Uh, and Hunter Biden appears to be one of the masters of helping foreigners gain influence in the United States. And the final question is, all right, he's been indicted on taxes. He's been indicted on gun uh, charges. Will he get indicted unfair? And what we know is that prosecutors have told the court that that part of the investigation is still active. They're still looking at it. In fact, that part of the investigation is what blew up the plea deal because Hunter Biden was going to plead out to some really great uh, low-level charges and avoid any risk of prison. But uh, the prosecutor said, listen, you're not going to be exonerated from Farah. And, of course, uh, that uh, set off Hunter Biden's uh, fireworks, and, and that deal fell apart. And the judge, of course, uh, zeroed in on the fact that the two sides did, were talking past each other. But the three things that uh, Democrats in this modern era often say they're against, tax cheating, foreign lobbying, uh, and uh, uh, impermissible gun use, uh, Hunter Biden seems to be the trifecta of what you're not supposed to do as a Democrat. And influence peddling, we could add that to the list. And that's what bothers me the most. But I want to talk to you more about that when we get back from this quick break. So everyone hang tight. We'll be right back. Are you prepared for the unexpected? As a former emergency manager, being prepared is not a choice. It's a necessity. And that's where the wellness company comes in. Imagine having the peace of mind that you're equipped to handle any medical crisis from tick bites to the latest pandemic. The wellness company's medical emergency kit is your lifeline. Packed with essential medications like ivermectin, emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and more. This kit is your ultimate preparedness solution. The wellness company's team of renowned medical professionals, including Dr. Peter McCullough, Dr. James Thorpe, Dr. Harvey Risch, Dr. Drew Pinsky, and more. They are truth-seeking doctors and they have designed a kit that sets the gold standard for safety and prevention. Don't wait for the next crisis to strike. Visit twc.health PAS and use promo code PAS for an exclusive 10% discount just for being a listener of this show. Prepare today, rest easy tomorrow, use code PAS at checkout. Welcome back, everyone. So, John, in my opinion, it's not really about Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden was simply a stooge going around. He was being exploited so that the family could get rich. That's right. You know, everyone wants to see, like, the smoking gun where Hunter Biden's messaging his father saying, hey, dad, I got that bag of ca cash from China or Russia or some other oligarchy. But usually these things are much more complex than that. Isn't that right? Yeah, though, sometimes not as complex as we think. Um, as you know, over the last month, I've been able to get these documents, 3.39 million pages of documents that the FBI, the Securities Exchange Commission, and the IRS got from Hunter Biden and his business partners all the way back in 2016. And I'm sure your team loves going through these. Documents. Oh, that's why my desk is so messy behind me. There's documents everywhere. I could I could die in a paper avalanche. But it's... Um, <laughs> 
they're really remarkable documents. And one of them that I think is uh, really powerful is there's a moment where Hunter Biden is trying to uh, capitalize or try to make some sort of connection in, among Greek Americans and Greeks. And of course, they basically say the you often unwritten rule, oh, my dad's done a lot for Greeks, we can cash in on this. They actually make it very clear that they're trading in on the on the name of Joe Biden to make these things happen. Um, the government has known that. They've known, uh, uh, the FBI has known since at least 16, that, that when Joe Biden was over in China meeting with President Xi the first time as vice president, right after Xi had taken over, uh, the very first person that Joe Biden stepped out of the long meeting with uh, the world leader of China and into was a meeting with Hunter Biden's um, business partners in China. Um, the same corrupt company or allegedly corrupt company, Burisma, that um, entertained uh, contacts with uh, Amos Hochstein, uh, was also at a Cafe Milano dinner where Joe Biden attended. And uh, you can go through Joe Biden is having meetings at the um, Naval Observatory with some of Hunter Biden's clients. He's having dinner with uh, a Russian oligarch that a lot of people in the American government had suspicions about. Um, Joe Biden was facilitating his son's um, influence peddling in. Now, I think the most important question that Congress has not answered must be answered between now and Election Day. We know for certain Joe Biden looked in the camera in 2019 and lied to us and said when he said, my family didn't get any money from China. They got millions from China. I didn't meet with my son's business partners. He did. The laptop is fake. No, it's real. We, the government's now ascertained that. But here's the question that I think is the simplest and easiest potential issue for the American public to understand about this. Given the nature of who Hunter Biden was dealing with, people that were going to be indicted or were indicted, people who were deemed corrupt by the U.S. government, people who were deemed corrupt by the Romanian government, uh, Russian oligarchs who had trouble getting American bank accounts because of suspicions about their activities, um, it is almost improbable that the FBI and the intelligence community did not give Joe Biden and perhaps Barack Obama defensive briefings, basically saying, hey, Hunter Biden's dealing with these people. Here's the issue with these people. Be careful. The uh, For the first time, both Jim Jordan and James Comer have dialed into that issue. In the last week, they both came on my show, confirmed that they're now looking at, they have a request in, they're going to fight to get but the information. But other problem is that you have the yeah. CIA at the time that was run by John Brennan, another yeah. stooge, another lackey, and yeah. his fingerprints are, are kind of all over the place too with this, right? Sure. Well, he was trying to set up Trump on Russia collusion, right? We know that. But listen, the great thing about the government is if they gave a briefing, there is a record of it. Uh, the government keeps records of everything. They're, they're pat racks uh, for history. And I think that if there is proof that Hunter Biden and Joe Biden got a defensive briefing, which, by the way, Hillary Clinton got one in 2016 about somebody who's trying to influence her campaign. If they did that. The only one that didn't was Trump. Trump's the guy that doesn't. Uh, they, they, they're, they're looking at Russia collusion, and they never give the guy a warning like they would give anyone else. But it seems improbable that Joe Biden and Barack Obama didn't get it. That's what all the experts who've come on my show say. If it becomes that simple, Joe Biden was warned, and he still facilitated his son's influence peddling in the millions to his family. It becomes a much simpler story about Joe Biden's contact. It's not did he have a phone call or not have a phone call? Did he get the intelligence people to lie about the laptop or not? It'll be, he was warned and he still facilitated it. That becomes very simple going into the November election. We'll see if Congress can deliver, but they're fighting for that information now. It shouldn't be hard to get. And it does get simpler, but he's too mentally uh, incompetent to stand trial <laughs> at this stage in his life. So that's uh, according amazing. to Robert Hur, that's the case. Yeah, we'll <laughs> see how incompetent he was if we ever get those tapes. Now, I, I want to move along to go sure. to public health, right? So we see yeah. the corruption within the Department of Justice and the State Department, what went on with Burisma and the Biden yeah. family business. Now we move on to public health. Another report from Just the News that you broke. And this one was about that the government wants to delay the non-public COVID vaccine safety numbers and data until 2026. What's that about? Well, it's about um, violating the first rule of good medicine. Uh, good, uh, the rule of medicine that has dominated a quarter uh, of, of a millennium of American history is that uh, you are to believe that uh, informed consent is at the heart of every decision. You're told the risk, you're told the benefits, and then you make the best decision for yourself. The CDC in February of this year still urged elderly American seniors 
to get yet another COVID booster. I don't know if we're at four, five, six, seven. I don't know how many boosters we're up to now. I think it's like 73. It could be. It could be. It's it's uh, it's uh, almost as many foreign as uh, Hunter Biden had foreign clients. It's really crazy. But it um, so there's pressure for certain classes of Americans to get yet another shot. And there's a secret database that the FDA has had that was outside of the normal uh, adverse events reporting. So there's the vaccine adverse um, events reporting system, VAERS. And that's where all data about the safety, good and bad, about vaccines is supposed to be. But we now know, we've confirmed uh, through documents, that there was an off-the-books one that had a lot of data about COVID-19 that's not in VAERS. We sued, and the FDA said, oh, God, we're so busy. We're not going to be able to get this to at least 2026, so can you just delay any talk about this for 18 months? Think about that. That means people in 2024 who are making a decision about whether to get another booster of the vaccine uh, are going to be deprived of what's ever in that database. It violates the very basis of our public health system that transparency and informed consent are the key to making good medical decisions. The FDA does not want the American people to know whatever's in that database. Maybe it shows the vaccine's good. Maybe it shows the vaccine's bad. The early indications are the vaccine hasn't lived up to a lot of its promises, but what's in this database? And the FDA said, oh my God, we're so overworked. We're getting lots of foreign requests. We just need 18 months off and then come back and we'll pick this back up. Well, if you remember, it wasn't that long ago when the same FDA was making had a staff spending time making social memes. If they have time to make some social memes, maybe they could get some informed consent documents to the American people. And you and I both know the way the bureaucracy works. So 26, uh, 2026 comes along and then it's the midterm elections. Oh, yeah. we need to kick this off to 2028, 2029. We got and, bird flu now or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it reminds me of what Hillary Clinton's documents. When was it? Like 2060, the State Department said yeah. they would furnish everything. It's completely ridiculous, but you're right. It's a betrayal. It's a betrayal uh, of, for the American people that yep. they were forced. And I feel bad for all those parents out there. I remember watching commercials in New York State where you had the public service announcements. I wouldn't yeah. give my kids that wasn't anything 100 percent safe. And so many parents listened to that. Yeah. And it really is horrible what was done. Yeah. How can these institutions rebuild trust when they continue to act this way? Uh, it's a great question, right? You, know, you have the Justice Department, you have the FBI, a story I broke just uh, three weeks ago that the FBI in security clearance reviews were now asking whether an agent supported Donald Trump went to a Second Amendment uh, rally or uh, had hesitancy about the COVID vaccine. Three uh, um, events that are protected by the First Amendment. You don't give up your First Amendment when you work for the FBI. So we now have political litmus tests in the FBI. We've got a Justice Department that's going after their boss's political chief rival with not one, but two uh, criminal cases in the New York system that's gone after the same rival. Uh, and, and then you have a public health institution that got uh, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars to prepare for a pandemic that didn't get anything, almost anything right about the original COVID-19 vaccine. And now we're too busy censoring the people that were getting the things right. That's right. They had to censor them. And, uh, you know, Anthony Fauci is like, I don't know how the mask mandate happened. Wait a second. You're the guy that imposed it. I don't know where it came from. Uh, I don't think the vaccines turned out to be what we said they were. Oh, really? Uh, so I just went on Fox a couple of weeks ago when Fauci said that, well, I wanted schools to reopen. I was trying yeah. to get them open. And I'm like, uh, they're trying to rewrite history, the revisionist history. I mean, all these people need to be held accountable. It does. And I think that one of the key things that we have to step above the trees and get a, a view of the forest is right now we're in a war on truth. Uh, if we can make a sitting president look like he's a stooge of the Russian government when he wasn't, if we can make a laptop look like it's Russian disinformation when it wasn't, when we can make a vaccine look efficacious and mask look efficacious when they weren't, um, we are. Uh, if we can uh, now convince people that there are more than two sexes in America, there's more than male and female, we're eroding these fundamental truths. And uh, many people look at this war on truth and say, if it isn't reversed and if the institutions who are uh, imposing this war on truth aren't fixed, aren't punished, uh, then the second war will be against our liberties because uh, the most fundamental truth our government is based on is that we're endowed with inalienable rights from our creator. But if you start destroying all these truths, then uh, you no longer have to abide by the acknowledgement that maybe we're endowed with the First Amendment or the Second Amendment or all the other amendments that we are pri right to privacy and other things that our founding fathers built this great experiment on. Um, I think that these institutions have to get right with what they've done 
to the um, uh, truth in this country. They've lied to us. They've misled us. Joe Biden looked in the camera and lied his theory ear off to us. Um, Joe, Anthony Fauci gave us a whole bunch of medical advice that wasn't based on any science, even though he kept saying, follow the science. He wasn't following the science. Um, in order for these institutions to rebuild truth, the first thing they have to do is acknowledge that they have been engaged in falsehoods and in, in harming truth. And in some ways, the truth has been harmed enough to infringe liberties, like imposing vaccines on people when we should have medical choice, like uh, censoring people's political expression on Twitter or Facebook, like happened in 20 and 2021. Uh, I don't think these institutions can correct themselves or the American people reassert their trust in them until they acknowledge what they've done wrong. And one of the things that you see in a great story that uh, Greg Piper uh, on our Just the New staff did this morning is these bureaucrats still don't think they've done anything wrong. They think they've been armed by some supreme being to be the arbiters of truth and to be the determinant of what we, the American people, should know or not know. And there is a cultural... Um, um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's something in the cultural DNA of these uh, bureaucrats, of these political elitists that run from big tech and big media to big government uh, that uh, says that we're smarter than the rest of the 99% in America. We're elitists. We went to Harvard. We went to medical school. We went to law school, whatever it is. Went to J school. I don't know what makes <laughs> them feel so supreme, uh, but we know better from you and we're going to start making decisions for you until that acknowledgement is made until it's apologized for until it's fixed i'm not sure americans are going to go and trust these institutions much longer and in fact they may be tempted to destroy these institutions certainly by cutting their budget so drastically that they can't exercise the power that they've uh, exercised over all of us over the last 10 years well i hope that actually happens because you have a complicit press that runs with the government narrative you have a press that actually runs interference for the government to protect them and the bureaucrats. And it's really become a problem. I mean, this is supposed to be the fourth estate. That's supposed to be the watchdogs over the government and government bureaucrats. Instead, it's assisting, it's cooperating with them. And that's a big problem. And I want to talk about a piece that Just the News put up. And it's an article by Greg Piper, Democracy Dies in the Department of Homeland Security. So I want to talk to you about that when we get back from this quick break. So everyone, hang tight. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. So Just the News put out a piece. Author was Greg Piper, who wrote that democracy dies in the Department of Homeland Security. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the CISA director, Jen Easterly, who wanted to take cognitive functions. So the way we think, the way we process information and move cognitive functions and declare it cognitive infrastructure, putting it under Homeland Security's critical infrastructure protection. Not only that, but she talks about this idea of malinformation. Malinformation is information that is true, but can cause, cause harm. And I think that you're on to something. I think you're on to something important because you're 100% right about it. These are the self-anointed guardians of democracy who will destroy democracy. They want to create democracy the way they see fit. And they're looking to destroy democracy in order to rebuild it in their vision, where as long as you obey, comply, and they'll dictate what liberties you can express, then we'll be fine. Cross that line, then there's a problem. It appears that after the 2016 election, the, the bureaucrats believed that the American people made a mistake, that the American people voted against uh, the interests uh, of the bureaucracy, and we've proven that we can't be trusted. So it's their job to correct the mistake that we made because they know what's in our best interest, what's in our family's best interest, and we're too dumb to realize. When you look at this Homeland Security Advisory Group that was led by Clapper and Brennan, two notorious officials who should actually be in prison, and it ta they talk about infiltrating families. I mean, essentially turning family members into informants against each other, pitting family member against family member or, or teacher against student. And it's really frightening because it reminds me of Saddam Hussein's Iraq. That's exactly what would happen. In fact, I actually spoke about this on the podcast in a June 23rd, 2021 episode when the Biden administration released the National Strategy for Countering Domestic Terrorism. And it was laid out in Pillar 2. Like, they are upfront about it. It's in your face. They tell you what they want to do 
page 20 to 21, you can read it there, where it talks about the infiltration of families. Where it talks about the infiltration of communities and having community members start ratting each other out. Where are we in the United States? That's right. It, it is. We've um, uh, what the most amazing part of those documents that Greg Piper put out today is the concept that we use in the post 9-11 era to fight against or to be vigilant against the greatest security threats America had faced in the modern era. Terrorism. Uh, uh, say, see something, say something was being turned around so that you were now being asked to say something if you found a conservative in your family or in your classroom or in your doctor or in your employment place. Oh my God, this, <laughs> our founding fathers would be laughing their asses off thinking this is some comedy that they went to the Shakespeare Theater with, except this is our current government. These are the people funded by our tax dollars and what they're doing now is turning. And just the- let's be honest for a second. It, it's not just about conservative, nope. right? Because this is oh, the, no. the, the new world that we're living in. Yep. If you praise the Constitution, well, you're deemed an extremist. You're deemed a, a conservative. If you use the word patriotism, you're deemed conservative. Like normal things, normal political positions, right. longstanding for the last 60 years are now far-right extremists, even though they used to be centrist just like 15 years ago. If you're the KGB successor inside of Russia, or if you're the intelligence ministry inside of China, you're thinking, I don't need to do anything right now. Just let the guys running the US government destroy this country from within. That's what's going on right now. Everything that was a fundamental truth, a fundamental value of American uh, society has been turned on its head by this 20-year birth of elitism. Uh, It's given us big government, big tech, big media, big Hollywood, big culture, big transgender ink, uh, and um, all of the things that made us distinctive to the world and distinctive to ourselves, trusting in each other, uh, has uh, been turned on its head. And uh, we are living in one of the most existential moments of American history, and the threat is not as great from the outside as it is from inside our own system, our own values, our own inability to appreciate differences and to tolerate them, uh, to uh, realize that free speech should always be free, even if it's offensive, um, or that our Second Amendment, it was there to protect us against all tyranny, government or private. Um, There is a fundamental uh, revisionism of all of the values of America to America's a racist society. You, the American people, can no longer be trade, uh, trusted to make your own decisions. And as a result, we're going to infringe your freedoms for your own good, and you're going to like it, whether you like it or not. And I think that's what we're living in this moment of uh, complete, it's, it's one of the most un-American moments in our great history. We're acting like we're not America right now. And I think the scariest and most frightening aspect to it is uh half the country, if not more than half the country, is actually okay with it. I think yeah. that that's what yeah. actually terrifies me more because people should be outraged about this. One last question. Sure. Crazy times. I'm going to ask you to put on a predictor cap. Uh-oh. This year's October surprise. Yeah. <laughs> How big do you think it's going to be? Or um, will October surprises have less of an effect given that people are going to be voting so early? Yeah, you might need an August surprise because people start voting in mid-September, and I think, and they don't stop for like six weeks, seven weeks. Isn't that crazy? Um, I think the biggest surprise will not be the, I think the American people's receptiveness to Democratic scandal has gone way down. They won't even accept a conviction in a a, a lawful court in New York now because of what they've seen happen. Uh, I think the biggest surprise may be on the opposite side of the field. It may be that Republicans for the first time engage in a form of early voting that uh, undoes the six-year advantage that Democrats have had, and Democrats wake up on election day saying, where'd all those votes come from? Wait, our system was turned against us. Well, let's be honest. The polls aren't making much sense because I'm seeing polls where Donald Trump's drawn in 20% of the black vote, about 40% of the Hispanic vote. And yet it's a close election. But if yeah. those numbers are real, if we really do see that exodus away it's over. from yeah. Democrats, there, there's no chance that Biden can yeah. win. No, that's right. And also Biden has another reality, which is he's running against three Democrats and one Republican, right? Because he's got Jill Stein and he's got the Harvard professor and he's got um, RFK. And all three of those tend to pull more from him than from Donald Trump. So as we saw in the uh, primaries, there are Democrats who would rather lose but feel good about having a protest vote. So they're probably going to vote for an RFK or a Jill Stein 
or someone else uh, to register their discontent with uh, Joe Biden. This anti-incentivism, anti-Israeli um, sentiment is going to continue to tear at the party. And Joe Biden's going to continue to say democracy is at stake. And most Americans will say, no, what's at stake is my ability to put food on the table, gas in the car and keep my kids safe. And that uh, have them raped under a bridge by two immigrant uh, wearing uh, uh, government ankle braces. And I think that um, the the dynamic is the elitists that created this very difficult 10 year experience in America are totally disconnected from the reality of Americans. They were a little bit disconnected in 16. That's what horrified them. I think they're way more disconnected this time. I don't think they see what's about to come around. And I do think the big thing is that all the support, particularly in in new uh, people now newly looking at the Republican Party, uh, it's soft support, meaning it doesn't automatically translate a a, a percent in the poll doesn't mean it's going to be a percent more in voting. And what I think Republicans are doing below the radar that Democrats have no idea is they're doing the Democratic 2020 strategy, which is we're going to get low propensity voters who probably are with us, but they're not going to go on election day. They might be taking care of the kids and homeschooling. They might have to run the business for 15 hours on Main Street because there's a lack of employees. They're not going to vote on election day, but if Republicans get them to vote between September 25th and November 5th, the numbers are going to look far different than the last three elections. I think that might be the biggest October surprise. Well, I know you're going to stay on top of it in Just the News. Everyone needs to check out Just the News. Trust me, you won't be disappointed. They're breaking Thanks, stories Steve. left and right. John, always a pleasure to have you on. Love being on the show. Love your podcast. Listen to it often. It's very important to me. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the PAS Report. Don't forget to rate, share, and hit that subscribe button. That way you'll never miss an episode. For more exclusive content and updates, visit us at PASReport.com and follow Professor Giordano on all social media platforms at PAS Report.